So we're in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Tonight, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to pick it up in verse 6. And just by way of introduction, um, this is Paul's second letter to Timothy. That's kind of self-evident. That's why we call it 2 Timothy. Written somewhere around AD 66 or 67 while Paul is in prison in Rome. This is his, probably his second imprisonment in Rome. He's held in chains in the Mamertine prison. These are Paul's last words, written just days before he will be led out of the city and be beheaded. This is the account that was given in Fox's Book of Martyrs. It says, Paul, the apostle who before was called Saul, after his great travail and unspeakable labors in promoting the gospel of Christ, suffered also in the first persecution under Nero. Abdias declareth that under his execution, Nero sent two of his esquires, Phariga and Parthemius, to bring him word of his death. They, coming to Paul, instructing the people, desired him to pray for them, that they might believe, who told them that shortly after they should believe and be baptized at his sepulcher. This done, the soldiers came and led him out of the city to the place of execution, where he, after prayers made, gave his neck to the sword, and he was beheaded. Now, don't forget this. The reason I was, I was thinking, you know, I just, we just read this thing last week. Is it too much to review what Fox, Fox's Book of Martyrs says? But it's not, especially when you think about where we're going tonight at the end of the Scriptures. We're going to go through uh, verse 12 tonight. Um, so, Paul um, has, throughout the letter, has had a continuing concern for doctrinal purity. That's a big deal in this letter. There were people that were teaching strange doctrines. He encourages Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth. And Timothy, as a servant of God, needs to be able to help those who are getting off track with, with, with bad doctrine. He needs to be able to teach them, teach them with gentleness. And, uh, and he warned, we saw this last week, that, he, that in the last days, men would stray from God. And last, remember all the words we looked at last, it was like a vocabulary test, almost like, because we haven't had vocabulary tests since fourth grade, I don't know, vocabulary test. But, but that's what it was like to just to, to think about all the stuff that's just like 3D, ultra 3D in color of today, of what's going on. Um, people would look religious on the outside, but inside they'd be impure and proud and cruel. Um, verse 5 of 2 Timothy 3, where we left off last week, he says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power from such people, turn away. He's saying that that's the way it will be in the future. And now he's going to take that, that peak into the future, which is almost like us today. It's, I'd, I'd say it's us today, but well, it is us today. But he's going to now bring it back to his present time, where... Um, um, and talk about these same traits. Um, so verse chapter, that's actually chapter 3. Boy, is it going to say chapter 2 the whole time? It's, it's actually chapter 3. Oh boy. Typo, and that one's going to last for a long time. Sorry. So he says verse 6, chapter 3, verse 6. For this sort are those, talking about the people who are religious, but, but inward, they're just, they're horrible. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. Of this sort. Now he's, going to give, he's giving examples of the kinds of false teachers that he's warning Timothy about. And I would imagine that he probably has specific people in mind in Ephesus, because that's where Timothy's at right now. He's still in Ephesus and will be till he dies. And so he probably has specific people in mind. He says those are of the sort that creep into households. They creep into households. The word's kind of interesting for creep. It's the word enduno, which means to put on, to enter. It usually describes putting on a garment. That's, you, that's the, normal, the more normal definition of the word. And the idea is that, is that these false teachers will be slipping into people's lives like somebody slips into a coat. You're just going to slide into it. They're going to slip into people's lives, into their households. It reminded me of there's an old Arab fable about, about a man who allows his camel just to stick his nose into the tent. 
you know, the camel just want, I just want to stick my nose in it. I just want to see what your, your, your tent looks like. And peeks, actually peeks under the, the, the edge of the tent. And next thing before he knows it, the entire camel is in the tent. You've ever heard that, that, that picture? <coughs> There's a phrase, the camel's nose. It's even used today. And the Arabs had a proverb that stated, beware of the camel's nose. So the idea is that these people kind of slide into people's lives. They slide into their households <coughs> and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins. Now, I don't have this, in my, I don't have this on, the, on the screen. <coughs> Boy, Jerry, you're making me cough. It's Jerry's fault that I'm coughing. No, it's, no you're not. I'm, I'm a little bit sick myself. The word gullible women is actually simply the word little women. It's, it's, they make captives of little women, and it's, and it's a strange thing that, it's, that you would think that the word women could be in a gender neutral. In, in Greek, there's, there's masculine, feminine, and there's neuter, just like many other languages. <laughs> this is neuter. So... They call it gullible women, but really it's not really male or female. It's little people. People who aren't using their brains very much. It says he makes captives of them. The word makes captives. This, this is a really interesting word. Aikma <coughs> lotuo. The first part, aikma, is the word for spear. Lotuo is to take captive. To take captive with spear. It, it's... Um, it's... it's it's capturing somebody by force. You know, it's the guy that sticks a gun in your back and demands that you, you go with him somewhere. That's the idea. They make captives of gullible women. This word's interesting the way it's used <coughs> in the scripture. Paul uses it a couple times. It's not used that often. He uses it once in a, in a positive way where he talks about our mighty spiritual weapons that we have available for us in our mind. This, you've ever heard of the, the, spirit, the, the powerful weapons available to us in 2 Corinthians 10? He says that with these weapons, we should be casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, that's this word, to take captive with a spear. Take, put a gun in in those bad thoughts back and make them do what you want. Sometimes we think that we are just, I have no control over my thought life. You know what? You do. In Jesus' name, you do. You can take authority over the bad thoughts in your life. You don't have to be, you don't, you don't have to be powerless against bad thoughts. You can, you can take out a gun and stick it in its back and say, Okay, let's just let's just turn around and let's just think about something else. You know, you have the ability to do this. Paul uses the word to describe how our sin nature traps us and makes us captives. He uses it in Romans 7:23, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin um, which is in my members. And we experience this captivity when we give in to sin. And, and, it, and it becomes a repetitive sin. And you can't get over it, right? Have you ever done that before? Have you ever tasted of that? Of course you have. We've all tasted of it. You're not the only one who's ever got caught in sin. It's like, it's like the sin has a gun in a, to your head saying, you've got to do this. Well, you know, you don't, friends. You don't. In our text, these false teachers are preying on vulnerable people little people, little women, who are struggling with guilt and shame. And that's the weapon they're turning against them. It's with their guilt and their shame. False teachers will, will use guilt to manipulate people into going down the wrong paths. They use guilt like a spear to hold them captives. Some of these concepts make me think about the various cults that, get peop that people get caught in. We'll be talking about some cults over, over, the, over tonight. But I also think about, about, and I'm sorry, but some of the televangelists are quite manipulative. Like this guy. I just can't, this guy cracks me up. 
You know, I've owned three different jets in my life, and I and used them and just burning them up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Televangelist Jesse Duplantis says God himself told him it's time for an upgrade. He said, I want you to bleed me for a Falcon 7X. So I said, okay. A Falcon 7 jet like this one to preach to more people around the world. And he's asking his followers for the $54 million. I really believe that if Jesus was physically on the earth today, he wouldn't be riding the donkey. From his Louisiana headquarters, Duplantis is among a group of televangelists who preach that their wealth is God's will. This preys upon the poorest people that want and need money badly, where they're told if they give money, God's going to bless them a hundredfold. Duplantis lives in a 35,000 square foot mansion, tax free. He's asking everybody who has less than he has to pay for this jet, and I, I don't get that, you know? Fellow televangelist Kenneth Copeland recently bought a $36 million Gulfstream 5 jet. Praise God. Oh, it ain't good. The two have commiserated about how they can't fly or pray with commercial airline passengers. This dope-filled world, right. get in an air, get in a long tube with a bunch of demons. Right, that's exactly it. And it, it's deadly. <laughs> We asked Jesse Duplantis and his ministries for comment, but they declined to respond. So far, no indication whether he's received any contribution for his jet. Wow. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. Well, that was just yesterday. I showed that clip because I saw the yesterday. There's nothing new with this stuff. Manipulating people, the very, the very poorest of, 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 of folks are the ones that end up giving in to this kind of stuff. Um, you don't have to preach the gospel. What, you can't share the gospel with those demonic people on, a, on, on, the, on the commercial jets? What, you got to ride your 50, $54 million jet to preach the gospel? No, no, I'm sorry. It's, this is just manipulation. It says, verse 6, that led away by various lusts. Now, he, he is talking about the women, these gullible people who are being led astray by the false teachers who are exploiting the cravings and the lusts of the, the weak people the, or the women. Probably, though, <clears throat> I would dare say directed by the lusts of the men who are doing this. Um, there are examples through history of this. Uh, in Paul's day, uh, the heresy of Gnosticism was beginning to develop. The Gnostics believed that you needed to, uh, to have a special knowledge, their special knowledge, if you wanted to know God. And of course, we will share our special knowledge with you, all for five easy payments of fifty-four ninety-five, you know, or whatever. And they come up with a price, and they charge everybody for this stuff. There was several forms of Gnosticism, but one form believed that there's nothing wrong for a believer to do anything sinful. There's, nothing, there's no such thing as sin, because... Because the body is evil, and it's only your spirit that's good, and your spirit's going to go to heaven, so who cares what you do with the body, because it's not going to heaven, so therefore do whatever you want. That's the way they would teach. Horrible things. You know, good old Joe Smith, Joseph Smith, touted as a prophet, but don't forget that after establishing his new religion, he began to espouse, first secretly, marriage with multiple wives. And in 2014, the Mormon church finally admitted, because for years they would say, oh, no, 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 he only had one wife, Emma, Emma Smith. Um, though there's been lots of documentation given over the years, not so. But they finally admitted that he had up to 40 wives, and one of them as young as 14 years old. His successor, Brigham Young, had 55 wives. Do you remember David Koresh? This was what? Uh, 20 years ago, something like this, the Branch Davidian leader practiced polygamy. I mean, it's not sure how many wives he had at the end, but he said he was entitled to 140 wives, um, 60 of them as his queens, and 80 of them as his concubines. He's being, he's being nice. He's not quite as much as Solomon, you know. In contrast, friends, Paul had, has already wrote, we saw in chapter 2, flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So see, these false teachers were, were scooping people up and leading them right down a horrible road. It says, verse 7, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And And... 
this is, I believe this is still talking about the gullible people who have been led astray. They have no discernment, and that's why they're led astray. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. In his book, The Gospel According to Starbucks, The Gospel According to Starbucks, do I hear, do I hear an amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> Leonard Sweet tells a story of Ed Fobert. Fobert is what you call a cupper, or in layman's terms, he's a coffee taster. And his perspicacious, that's what it says, perspicacious taste buds are actually certified by the state of New York. So refined is his taste, uh, his sense of taste for coffee, that he can be blindfolded and he can take one sip of coffee and tell you that it's not just that it's from Guatemala, but from what state it comes, at what altitude it was grown, and on what mountain. That's, that's discernment. That's discernment. Um, the gullible person doesn't take time to learn to discern one taste from another. Let that not be you. We need to have discernment, lest we become little women, little, little men, gullible people. Um, Today, one of the strange teachings out there, this isn't in the church, well, I actually probably could be in some churches now, now that I think about it, but this whole thing about identity, like, like gender identity, that you can identify as anything you want. You can be whatever you want to be. And so instead of fixing problems, people just get patted on the back and things get worse. Here's, the, this is laughable, but, uh, oh, that's not good. Where's my video? My video is gone. Man, that was a good video. Ha! I wonder if the next video is in there. Warren, is there another video queued up in there? Well, we'll find out. Huh, how did that happen? That's a first. I'll tell you what it's a video of. It's a video of a 56-year-old man, father of seven, who now identifies as a six-year-old girl. And as, you're in, as they're interviewing him, and I've saw, I've saw several videos, he must like to be interviewed. He likes to be interviewed. Um, um, he, he, he claims he's now a six-year-old little girl, and he's fulfilling all of his hopes and dreams of, a, of being a six-year-old little girl, being able to do the, all the things that a little six-year-old girl always wanted to be. Of course, he does allow himself to drink coffee and drive cars and even drives his tractor. But, but he does it as a six-year-old little girl, and he's dressed up like a six-year-old little girl. Absolutely amazing. And, 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 and the person that, that's doing the video interviews people on the street, asking them, well, what do you think about this? And some people are like, that's like ridiculous. Other people are like, well, he could be that if he wants. Really? Really? Okay, verse 8. Now, as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses... So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. Janus and Jambres. Um, this is the only time we see these names in the Bible is here. The ancient rabbis had a tradition that these were the names of the magicians that went up head to head against Pharaoh as, um, as, as Moses is trying to encourage Pharaoh to let the people go. Um, Moses throws down his staff. This is in Exodus chapter 7. And, and it becomes a serpent, and they do the same, right? Remember that? Well, here, let me remind you. Let's see if this works. Okay. Oh, well, there's the video. Do you want to see it? No, we won't. I've already talked about it. Forget it. That's weird. That is really weird. Okay, here's, here's this. Let my people go. No, you know Stay what? Down. I want to show you the freak. <laughs> Don't you want to see the freak? Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I shouldn't call him that, right? <laughs> I'm not very nice. who now self-identifies as a six-year-old girl. What do you think of that? Man, I think it's interesting. I've actually never heard of someone identifying as a different age. I guess I shouldn't, you know, judge, you know, because everybody, you know, has their own, like, identity and stuff. Stephanie, that's his name, Stephanie. He abandoned his family. It's liberated me, and I don't have to act my age. 
by not acting my age, I don't have to deal with the reality that was my past. I don't have to think about adult stuff. I still drink coffee and drive a car, right? Even my tractor, but I still drive the tractor as a little kid. I drive my car as a little kid. I think that's enough, okay? Yeah, it's pretty weird, huh? Yeah. Um, no discernment. We've, we've let go of discernment. We've let go of being able to tell right from wrong. Um, and so, now, as Janice and Jamber resi resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt mind, disapprove concerning the faith. So, again, we think these, well, these are the names of the guys who, who went against Moses. Here's, here's the video. Let my people go. The slaves are mine. The lives are mine. All that they own is mine. <coughs> I do not know your God, nor will I let Israel go. Who are you to make their lives bitter in hard bondage? Men shall be ruled by law, not by the will of other men. Who is this God that I should let your people go? Aaron, cast down my staff before Pharaoh, that he may see the power of God. In this you shall know that the Lord is God. Jambres. There we go. So the rabbis taught, I thought this was interesting, <clears> that Janus, this is tradition, this is not scripture. The rabbis taught that Janus and Jambres didn't stop opposing Moses in Egypt, but they actually tried to mess with him at the Red Sea, and that these were the guys that inspired the golden calf, according to Jewish tradition, and that they had been counselors helping Balaam lead Israel astray. And that's, that's what the Jewish rabbis taught. We don't know that any of that happened. We do know that these were, we're pretty sure these are the guys that opposed Moses in, in court. These are men of corrupt minds, disapproved concerning the faith. Talking about the bad teachers. These are guys who came, come from a really bad place in their mind. Corrupt mind. Disapproved concerning the faith. Their doctrine is not healthy, good, solid doctrine. Verse 9, but they will progress no further for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. Their folly will be manifested to all. The word folly, anoia, the, the noia, or, or it's a form of noose, which is the word mind. This is not mind. You don't have any mind. It's a want, a lack of understanding, folly, madness, expressing itself in rage. Um, just as Janus and Jambres couldn't keep up with God's miracles through Moses, the folly of the cults will ultimately be exposed. Joseph Smith claimed that he was translating the Book of Mormon from the language called Reformed Egyptian. Now, of course, after the archaeologists finally figured out how to translate Egyptian, they realized there's no such thing as Reformed Egyptian. Um, he claimed to translate a book from a scrap of papyrus he found in a, in a mummy that he bought off of an antiquities dealer. And, this, and he, they even reproduce 
this, this, uh, this the, the picture. Um, and he claimed that this was a, a picture of Abraham sacrificing Isaac in Egypt. And so, and so he spent time translating all of this and came up with this, one of the books that's in their, their scriptures, the Mormon scriptures, called the Book of Abraham. Well, uh, again, once uh, Egyptologists figured out how to translate Egyptian, it has nothing to do with Abraham. It has absolutely nothing to do with Abraham. Um, their folly will be manifest to all. And the point is that the truth will be revealed. It usually comes out as long as you're willing to do the work or to wait for it. Um, I found a really interesting story about a guy named George Jacob Schweinfurth. Schweinfurth. This guy's about 50 years after Joseph Smith. He's in Illinois back in the 1880s and 1890s. He led a cult named the Church Triumphant. Um, he was mentioned by name in one of my commentaries. Just one little line, and I thought, oh, I'll find out about this guy. I found out about this guy. I've never heard of this thing before. <laughs> this guy, George Jacob <laughs> Jinkleheimer Smith. <laughs> George Jacob. Schweinfurth. He had been following a woman named Dorinda Beekman who declared that she was Jesus. And, uh, and then she died. And she claimed that she would rise again from the dead after three days. Well, after three days, George claimed that her spirit now lived inside of him and that he's now the Christ. And so... He set up a big house in, in this town of, in Illinois, and he named the house Heaven. And then he, he populated the house with all the beautiful young ladies in town, and he called them his angels. He, he, they, were, they were Schweinfurth's angels, not Charlie's angels. And the other members of the sect, he forced to live in another house down the street, and these are the ones that had to go out and get jobs and plow the fields and earn, earn an income so that Schweinfurth and his angels could live in comfort in heaven. And their house was called hell. So they lived in hell. He lived in heaven. Um, eventually, many of the angels got pregnant. It was a miracle. He claimed the Holy Spirit must have impregnated them. And then the baby started being born, and they all had red hair like George Jacob Schweinfurth. And the truth came out. He was exposed. Uh, he moved to Chicago, took up Christian science, and became a realtor. <laughs> truth is revealed. It will be revealed. Um, the thing I thought was interesting through this passage past, present, and future. Paul's been showing us that people have always been tempted to get away from the truth. In the past, it was through people like Janus and Jambres. In the present, as in Paul's day, it was various cults, people departing from the truth. And in the future, that was last week's thing, there will be people departing from the faith, people depart, departing from truth. There is nothing new with people going off the rails. Truth will be revealed. Verse 10, he says, But you, Timothy, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance. You have carefully followed these things. <coughs> this is what discipleship is all about. Timothy is Paul's disciple. This is what discipleship is about. This is... This is a great grocery list of what we and most of us in here are of the older age. Uh, we've got a few of you younger folks, and, we, and it's great. But all of us, whether no matter what age you're at, if you're in here as an adult, we all have the responsibility to be discipling others, bringing up the next generation, pouring our life into the next generation, and here's the kinds of things that Paul considered discipleship. This is what it's all about. Discipleship is not just what the teacher imparts. Discipleship is not just the teacher's responsibility, but it's the student's responsibility to learn and to replicate these things. 
The word he says, you've carefully followed these things. Parakalutheo. To follow one as to be always at his side. To follow close. To examine thoroughly. To investigate. That's the, that's the richness of this word. Kalutheo is the word for follow. Para means alongside. So you're, you're going to be walking with somebody right next to them. That's what discipleship is all about. Um, and so you get, I think I've got seven things here just in this verse that involve discipleship. Discipleship involves teaching. The word doctrine is, the word doctrine is didascalia. It just means teaching, instruction. It's not about learning this kind of theology or that kind of theology. It's just teaching, simple teaching. Discipleship involves that you actually live your life and not just say things. That you actually live what you believe and that you don't just talk about things. Because he says, you have followed my agoge, my manner of life. You've walked in my, my footsteps. You've learned to do things the way I do them. That when... Um, when, when um, Dr. Frankenstein says, walk this way. Igor goes, yes, I'm walking this way. I don't know. I'm, there's a joke in there somewhere. I just, can't, I just messed up the joke. But it's the manner of life. It's the way that you walk. This is discipleship. Discipleship can't be done like this. This, on Thursday nights, this is the teaching part. But discipleship is you, you, you walking with me and you spending time with me, with people. Going out to lunch together with people. Um, talking, praying, pouring your ha- heart out to each other. You know, it's, it's, it's going to breakfast at Polly's. You know, it's doing life together. Discipleship involves vision, sharing vision. Helping the younger person develop a godly purpose for the life. Because he says, you followed my purpose. And the word purpose, prothesis. A setting forth of a thing, placing it in view, that's, that's vision, um, a purpose. And so, so watching Paul, being up close to him, Paul's heart for evangelism. You know, Timothy's got, he's got to grab that. Paul's heart to teach, to be involved in the scriptures. Timothy's got to grab that and go with it, these kinds of things. Discipleship it sets the example when it comes to trusting God, because he says you followed my faith. Pistis is the word for faith. And it can mean faith or fidelity or faithfulness. You could say that you've you followed my example of being faithful. But I think it also involves simply the act that Timothy watched Paul trust God. He watched Paul go, well we'll talk about this in a minute, but he watched he watched Paul go through the worst of times. And he watched Paul Trust God through it. You followed my faith. You followed after. You've, you've watched up close. Discipleship involves how you put up with difficult people. How you put up with difficult people. You followed my long suffering is the word. Macrothemia is the Greek word. It means patience, slowness in avenging of wrongs, Patience with difficult people. When Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13 that love is patient and kind, that's this word. It, it, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, it's not saying that love is patient going through hard times. That's a different word which we're going to see in a minute. But the word here is putting up with boogers. You know, people that are just bad. People that just get under your skin. I hope people don't learn to be patient by watching me. I just, I, I'm not that always that patient. But discipling others, you have to learn to pass on patience with difficult people. Patience with difficult people. Discipleship involves setting the example of unconditional love, making a choice to value people. What Greek word do you think that sounds like? Making a choice to value people. The, that's the word agape. That's the word. You followed my love. You've watched it. You followed closely right alongside and you've watched how I've made a choice to value people. So when Paul writes to the Corinthians, you know, hey, 
Love is patient. Love is kind. See, that's the better way to get along, by the way, gang, is, is to do the love thing. I'll show you the more excellent way. Well, Timothy knows that. He goes, amen. I've watched him do it. I've watched him do it. This is a part of discipleship, teaching how to love others. And discipleship learns not to quit. It, it's about teaching not to quit when things get tough. And the word here for perseverance, hupomone, that's the other word that sometimes is translated patience. Um, endurance, a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. I ain't going to get off track. This is hard. I don't like where I'm at right now. But I am not giving up. I am not quitting. And you know what? Timothy saw that in Paul. He's saying, you've watched it. You've learned it. You've followed closely. And this is what you've picked up. Well, they're challenging things, isn't it? You go through this list and you go, well, I don't know if i got much to teach on that one. But you do. See, that's the problem, is that you do have stuff to teach. It just may not be where it needs to be taught. Maybe you have some growing to do. Sure, sure. But that's, a part of, that's a part of being real, isn't it? Is to admit, you know what, I don't have this all the way. I may not have macrothumia, patience with difficult people, down all the way. You know, there are some people that, that, that walk into the office and I just like, I, I, Daniel, can you take that person? You know, or, or, I, or somebody's calling on the phone. And, uh, Daniel, I think I'll let you talk to them, you know. And, uh, and, or, uh, I'm not talking about any of you, by the way. I'm not talking about any of you. None of you. Maybe Ernie, I don't know. I, uh, no, 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 no. But see, part of, part of, part of discipleship is, is passing on the fact that, you know what, I'm not perfect, but I'm, this is where I'm going. This is a growing thing for me. This is what I'm learning. This is discipleship. We all should be involved in discipleship in realizing that we're passing these things along. And it goes on. He's got two more things in the next verse. You followed my persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured out of them all, the Lord delivered me. The last two things of discipleship is about persecutions and afflictions. Discipleship involves actually going through difficult times for the sake of following Jesus. And so, and so Timothy's watched this right up close. He's watched Paul go through hard times. And he's still trusted. He says, that which happened to me, and he mentions Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. Here, let's do, put this up on a map. Um, this is Paul's first missionary journey with Barnabas. They start in, out in Antioch of Syria, go to Cyprus, and then go up into the region we call Galatia, where they went to Antioch, Pisidia, Iconium, and then down to Lystra. So those are the cities that he mentions. These are in Acts chapters 13 through 14, if you want to do extra credit homework. Um, uh, the Antioch that Paul is talking about, the persecution in Antioch is not the one in Syria where they started from, which was the first place that the, the believers were called Christians. That's Antioch in Syria. There's actually several Antiochs throughout the empire, throughout the Roman Empire. But this is Antioch of Pisidia, um, and, uh, and in Acts 13, verses 44 to 52, we read about Paul being used to preach to multitudes in this, in this Antioch, but some of the unbelieving Jews became envious of Paul's popularity, and they ran Paul and Barnabas out of town. So they go to the next city. They go to Iconium. And, 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 um, and Iconium. So from Antioch, Pisidia, to Antioch of Pisidia, they moved to Iconium. The unbelieving Jews in Iconium stir up trouble for Paul. And they're, they're about to have Paul and Barnabas stoned, and so Paul leaves town, and they head for Lystra. At Lystra, things get even more interesting. In Acts 14.8, it says, And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. 
<coughs> and then when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. You would think it'd be the other way around because Paul's doing all the work. But no, it, Paul's the speaker so that makes him Hermes. Um, and, the, and when the priest... Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate. We have a barbecue, guys, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, <coughs> Man, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these things, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. There's the bad guys with the black hats show up. And having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went out into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Absolutely amazing story. And what, what a crazy, talk about one moment they love you and the next they hate you. How about that, you know? And they stone him, leaving him for dead. Well, Lystra, this is at Lystra. This is Timmy's hometown. Timothy is from Lystra. So when Paul writes to Timothy, he says, you know all the trouble I had at, at Antioch and, and uh, Iconium and Lystra? Now, at the time, Timothy was quite young. At this moment, he was quite young. It may be at this point that this is when Timothy's family came to Christ. But when Paul goes back a few years later in Acts 16, Timothy's grown up, and this is when Paul brings him along his side. He's watched Paul up close. He says, verse 11, What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Here's a pretty important lesson. Timothy is watching. Timothy is watching. Viviana is watching. Timothy is watching. Yeah, Ruthie's watching. She's a little young, but she's watching. I know I've shown this video before, but I just want to use it to set the stage. be aware that there are others watching your life. And I'm not just talking about the little ones. I mean, they still may be your children, might be your older children. Or it could be just the Timothys around you. People at work. People down the street. You might be aware that they're watching you. We usually hope that what they're seeing is all the successes in our lives. 
all the good things that we do, all the good things we do for them. Jacob, did you see what I did for you right now? You know, we're hoping we're noticing, they're noticing those things. We kind of hope that they don't see our failures too closely. But I kind of wonder, gang, if the thing that really catches the eye of the Timothy who is watching me is not when he sees how blessed I am, but in how I handle suffering. I would dare think that how I handle the tough times will be of the greatest impact on their lives. You know, mom wasn't perfect, dad wasn't perfect, but I watched what they went through. Will I demonstrate long-suffering, charity, patience, even when I'm in the fire? There's a Timothy in your life, gang, and he's watching. He says in verse 12, here's a wonderful, wonderful promise. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. You desire to live godly in Christ Jesus? Let me see your hands. Okay, here's the promise. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now that's not exactly one of those promises that I hear people name it and claim it. Uh, that's not one to, yay, <laughs> amen, I believe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I've heard that one yet. But here's the principle. Right living brings trouble. Um, and Paul didn't have to just tell Timothy this. Paul lived this. He would die knowing this. Because remember what's happening just a few days down the road. We read it about at the beginning. Um, I don't know about you, but I have this no notion that I can't escape from in my head. That if I do everything right, if I'm a good boy, if I eat all the vegetables on my plate, then I'll be rewarded and life will be easy. And, I'll be, and, and life will be good. Maybe you don't think that, but I do. Because when life is not good, I don't know about you, but I'm asking myself, what did I do to deserve this? Now, don't get me wrong. There may be, indeed, some things that are difficult, that are hard, that are bad, that maybe you did do something to deserve it. You rob a bank... You go to jail. Well, you went to jail because you robbed a bank. Okay, okay, I, 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 that happens. But sometimes the difficulty isn't because you did anything wrong. Sometimes the difficulty is because you did everything right. The truth is that when you take a step closer to Jesus, when you take a step to serve Jesus more, guess what? You're going to get pushback from Satan. If if you will stay a lukewarm Christian, if you will stay a Christian who, who is never, never affects anybody's life, who never speaks up, who never, who never you know, talks about Jesus, well then you, you can live a nice smooth life. But when you take a step and say, God, I want to serve you, get ready. Because all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You can expect it. There's an old story about John Wesley. He's the founder of Methodism, and I don't know whether it's true or not. I've, I've seen some things that make it sound like it might not be true, but I really like the story, so I'm going to tell it to you. So John Wesley was riding along the road one day, because he was, a, he was a, an itinerant preacher. He'd, he would travel by horseback and, and, and preach over and over every day. Um, and uh, it, as he's riding on the road one day, it had dawned on him that Three whole days had gone by without him not experiencing persecution. Not a brick or an egg had been thrown at him for three whole days. He was alarmed. He stopped his horse and he said, Can it be that I have sinned and I am backslidden? Because I haven't been persecuted? Nobody's thrown an egg at me for three days? Um, slipping from his horse, he goes down to his knees and he begins interceding with God to show him where, if any, that there was something wrong in his life. Well, on the other side of the street, there was a, a rough fellow. He heard him praying, 
He looked across and he recognized the preacher. He said, I'll fix that Methodist preacher. And he picks up a brick and he throws it at him and it missed him. But, but, but Wesley leaps to his feet, joyfully exclaiming, oh, thank God it's all right. I still have his presence. Praise God. <laughs> now, I don't know if that story is true, but I think it is how he lived his life. Um, he didn't let it hold him back. He didn't shrink back from following the Lord. Here's an article from, I'll end with this, from Moody Publishers 2011. So it's seven years old. The article's titled, Unknown Christian Brings Bibles into North Korea. In their book, The Privilege of Persecution, Carl Moeller and David Haig tell the story about a courageous believer who has helped their ministry, which is Open Doors USA. He's helped them smuggle Bibles and commentaries in, into North Korea. The Yalu and Tumen rivers form a naturally meandering boundary between the People's, the People's Republic of China and the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea. Night and day, soldiers from both armies stare vigilantly at each other through their high-powered high field glasses as they control traffic in and out of their respective countries. Those approaching the Chinese checkpoints find that travel moves at a snail's pace, for each is high risk and high security, and very few people are allowed to cross the heavily fortified border regularly. Behind the Korean border, the, the situation is not much different. There are checkpoints everywhere. Traveling inside North Korea is almost impossible. But one man does go around the country. To those of us in the West, he is known only as, quote, the traveler. He is one of the persons who helps distribute goods inside North Korea. Despite the ever-present danger of exposure, the traveler remains an unpretentious and simple man. He looks more like a blue-collar factory worker than the Korean James Bond. But that's one of the keys to his success. He's adept at blending in, remaining both vigilant and decisive. It's a matter of survival. He has served open doors for years, and yet we don't even know his real name. We never will. The fewer people who know it, the better. For if his secret work on behalf of God's people were ever to be discovered, it would mean a brutal death sentence for him. When our leaders spoke to him, we asked him what the church in North Korea prays for. This ostensibly emotionless man put his life on the line every day, often for people he's never met, living in cities he's never visited. He began to weep. He told of a church movement that has remained underground ever since the 50s. In order to wipe Christianity from the face of the land, Kim Il-sung's soldiers herded congregations into the streets, ran them over with bulldozers. Thousands of men, women, and children, nearly all of them North Korean citizens, were literally crushed to death. Their remains used to line roadbeds throughout the surrounding cities. To, um, Kim Jong-il, his son, um, under, under his regime, there, was, there is still 240,000 believers, direct descendants of those who were left behind. These North Korean believers are prayerfully focused on one purpose, to be in place and fulfill God's will for their lives. Their prayer is a pray for, prayer for liberation, for lifting of the darkness, for possibility to reopen the churches of their ancestors, and for reconciliation. So despite the dangers, the traveler continues to, ri to risk his life in order to equip believers with commentaries, Bibles, radio resources, training, and encouragement to keep them focused on the Lord. I know sometimes we're a little scared to stick our necks out. Maybe we shouldn't be. You know, we got nothing. We got nothing to complain about. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Can I get an amen? amen? Yeah, I don't think I want an amen on that one, huh? I wish it weren't so, huh? Let's stand and pray. And so, Lord, as your church, help us. We're weak, Lord. We, we can lack courage at times. We need you. We need your spirit to fill us and to encourage us. We want to represent you well. 
We want to see the Timothys around us. I would pray that maybe one, two, or three men or women in this group would seriously take a Timothy under their wings and purpose, purposely, intentionally draw them alongside so their Timothy can closely follow. and walk in our steps as we're trying to learn to follow you. Challenge us, stretch us. Use us, multiply us. We thank you. We thank you, God, for your work in our lives. We thank you that you are faithful. And then we can count on you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you guys.